and how is it going with the activities we're doing? How do we tell um, and that kind of thing? We'll get to some of that discussion uh, a bit later in the call under topics, I wanna say three, <laughs> topic three. Uh, but we thought we'd start with a general question from the call description, which was sort of what is your um, philosophy on measuring your activities and impacts? And we're thinking here specifically about like our activities as research supporting folk, um, you know, um, so those activities and maybe and the impacts of those activities. So I believe Martin had a poll all set up to, um, and he's put that into the Zoom chat. So feel free to open that link and add your thoughts and then um, the answers will come in in a word cloud. There's no wrong answer here. Um, so feel free to share. Um, if anyone knows that they feel passionately about this and want to share a little bit about what they're doing, drop your name into the chat. <laughs> I will just add to what Christina said. Kind of our goal for this call is to first uh, come up with a, uh, some kind of a way, uh, or uh, I shouldn't say this. Uh, the goal is to look at why do, or, uh, do we, or why, why are we measuring our activities, then how we can kind of make our impact better by uh, looking at this uh, time and project management strategies, we'll talk later, and then we will kind of wrap it up by, by uh, sort of kind of the, the grand goal in a way, you know, how uh, or what, uh, how these, these strategies can help us to improve uh, our performance. That's essentially kind of the gist of it. So we are more like a philosophically asking here at the beginning, why would we want to uh, self-evaluate ourselves or evaluate ourselves uh, for our supervisors or for our organization and things like that. Yeah, thanks for that context, um, Martin. That's a great way to uh, introduce that. So if, if folks have, ooh, I can probably share my screen because I'm now a co-host. <laughs> so I'm just gonna briefly share the results of the poll here. Um, and so I, I, I can see here um, sort of responses around um, uh, justification. <laughs> so we, what we're doing deserves to be funded, um, but also uh, priorities and planning and um, thinking about um, what's next, strategies, um, staffing, um, and sort of how, how we keep moving onward um, in our in our sort of day-to-day -day, uh, work. Christina, um, uh, we can ask uh, Jeffrey Weekly to yeah. ask a little bit about what he did at UC Merced and hopes to do at UCSC. Yeah, hi. For those of you who know me, you know I'm not shy. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and speak up. So um, uh, there, there is, um, you know, this tendency for us to say, oh, let's collect metrics. Let's, let's look at metrics, metrics, metrics. Um, and that's really only um, a very small part of um, the, the value chain that we try to create. Um, uh, so at UC Merced, the first thing that we did was as a, as a group, and I was lucky enough to be included in a leadership group there working for Ann Kowalczyk at um, UC Merced, is um, put a couple of stakes in the ground around what our strategic outcomes um, were to be for the entire department. Um, and they were build operational capacity, uh, fix IT, you know, um, so that uh, the organization was high performing, the technology was high performing, um, delivery of IT resources and services met the needs. Um, another strategic goal was create sustainability and scalability. 
And this is where we focused a lot in research computing at UC Merced was the sustainability and scalability. As you know, there is this tragedy of the commons with faculty who have startup funds or grant funds, and it's often in their best interest to spend those funds on themselves and not in ways that really reinforce the more general capability on campus. So sustainability and scalability was a real focus um, for us at UC Merced. Um, and then uh, we elevated the idea of creating um, and communicating value um, as a top priority. Um, the, as you know, the uh, paradox of IT is when it's really good, it sort of becomes transparent, it disappears. Um, and people just don't um, recognize that their lives are a whole lot better for the work that we do. Um, then we took those um, uh, four uh, strategic outcomes that we wanted to work for, and we tied them to objectives. Um, these are operationalized expressions of, of those more aspirational goals. Um, and then finally, we mapped those two um, uh, metrics and measurements about how we could get indicators, um, both quantitative and qualitative, um, about how we were achieving our goal. And we always wanted to circle back with our users to say, hey, how are we doing here? Um, because if we just looked at a, you know, the data, we might miss some qualitative thing that says, oh yeah, well, you know, you deployed um, two-factor authentication to everybody, but I had a terrible experience. Um, so if you're only measuring adoption, you wouldn't be capturing that qualitative um, feedback. Uh, and then um, we, we established some key performance indicators about what it was that, you know, um, the metrics were telling us. So one of the things that um, Anne always railed against was any of us putting up any metrics. She always says, I want to hear the story. What's the story you're trying to tell here? Um, and so we always had to tie it back to a story and those stories were typically anchored in our key performance indicators. Um, and those were things like increasing um, the operational capacity of the campus cluster. Um, and so we would measure how many users how um, you know is the system uptime uh, to where we want it to be? Uh, is it being utilized near its capacity or at optimal capacity? Um, what is the software that is installed and supported? And all of these things to tell the story about um, uh, how HPC was building a community of practice on our campus. We even had open office hours and tracked users, new users and issues in, in there. Um, and of course, everything was buttressed with uh, a service delivery platform. We happen to have ServiceNow. Um, and, and so it was a, it was a very uh, hol holistic approach that anchored all of our um, value chain to uh, our core principles of service, research, and education. And it was wonderful framework to work in. So at UC Santa Cruz, um, which doesn't have, uh, which has a lot more history um, and a lot more diversity um, in its research than UC Merced did. We're, we're striving towards something similar um, and we're just now forming groups uh, around um, setting those strategic goals, gathering um, metrics to support them, establishing KPIs and communicating value. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. I'm slightly distracted by your flaming bike tires. <laughs> that is a visual effect. Don't be alarmed. I figured, I figured. Ah, all right. And thanks for that, um, for that description, Jeff. And I would, if people are interested in talking further about that specific approach, feel free to jump in the chat and connect. <laughs> um, but I, I, what I heard there was that um, the philosophy behind, um, you know, measuring um, impact activities and the philosophy behind measurement is goals. Like you have goals and you want to see if you're um, achieving them. And I think that's, that's a great reminder um, and that that can be a, focusing on that helps to have a more holistic quote unquote measurement process than something that's um, strictly quantitative. 
uh, which yeah. I think is really valuable and could be some a good topic for another call. <laughs> Christina, something else that came to mind too is the word framework. Yeah. So instead of having a kind of a scattershot approach to different asks to have um, a longer term vision of exactly what would be useful uh, on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, that's what we're doing next at UC Santa Cruz. We're going to have a visioning session um, to, to try and map out what that, um, you know, overall framework is. But I think this was kind of just an intro topic, so we can move on to topic two. I have a question, Christina. Yeah. I'm really interested in this topic, and I guess my question is more how you really, um, because the question that I ask is, you know, if we were measuring things as individual or trying to measure our impact. And so I guess what I'm trying to find is just practical ways how we really measure, you know, we're talking here about measuring of, um, I don't know, how many, how many people we talk to, how, how many projects are, you know, come to mm -hmm. uh, success or. Yeah, we're going to circle back to that in topic three. So okay. let's, that's a great question. And I think one of the ones we were kind of hoping to spark from this conversation. Um, okay. But we'll, um, if you could add that yeah. in the uh -huh. notes and we'll come back to it for sure. Well, so that's a good segue to get to topic two. Um, topic two, uh, Martin is going to walk us through strategies or tools uh, that you're using to make the most of your time working with others and working from home. All right, so this is, this is kind of closer to my heart. Uh, and I am hoping what we're going to uh, get out of this is uh, some ways how you can measure uh, or quantify what, what you have done, not by, uh, you know, simple uh, uh, ways like writing stuff in a text file, but hopefully using some some uh, uh, platforms or tools that will allow you to uh, essentially track things and then generate reports by themselves, right? So, uh, and I admit that I'm not doing that myself, so I would like to hear from others if they do. Okay? And to kind of introduce the, the problem, uh, I might be more of an extreme case here, but uh, I am having a really hard time sort of scheduling my work, ta work time because, uh, I have a wife that works and we have two small kids. So we basically, uh, you know, what we have come up with is uh, when the kids basically need supervision by one of us. They, we cannot just, you know, let them watch videos all day and keep working, um, especially the younger one. So the younger one doesn't really care about videos yet. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, what we came up with is uh, uh, we came up with a bunch of calendars. We have each of us have our work calendars that are outlook based, you know, both we both work at the university and we created a shared Google calendar uh, because I'm scheduling my stuff mostly through, through Google uh, uh, where we put all the kids agenda, right? So who's, who's with the kid at what time, uh, what are the, the kids uh, schedules like school calls and things like that. And so what I would like to sort of hear from our community and we have the poll here, so go ahead and, and uh, kind of go through the poll. Uh, uh, we'll, there is two questions in this one. So maybe once we go through the first one, uh, then I will uh, move it forward to the second one. Uh, uh, the, the first question is how, uh, how you uh, manage your time, right? And so it is actually quite interesting to be here to see that I am not really that bad of a, or that, that big of a duck that we are using the calendars and I do actually use my head occasionally, although it's kind of getting a little bit harder to track uh, with the complexity. And I do have some, some documents. Uh, right, we, I don't use any time tracking platforms. And so what I would like to hear from others, what, uh, what, the, what do they like, what works out for them, uh, and you know, what tips would they have for me to, uh, to improve my scheduling? With the idea that theoretically, you know, my supervisors can see that then and you know, get an idea of what I'm doing, uh, maybe provide feedback or whatever, or have it for their own sake, you know, to know that I'm not just, you know, kind of, not doing anything, right? Yeah, and I saw Anna Lee and Scott had some ideas in the chat about just techniques. Yeah, so let's start with Anna Lee. Yeah, hi. Um, I thought I was muted and I wasn't, sorry. Um, 
I came across this method developed by someone named Pierre Kawand. I think he's based in San Francisco called the perfect 15 minute day. I'm always skeptical of anything that has the word perfect in it. Um, but I like the 15 minute part. <laughs> so um, it basically is uh, just a method um, that he developed that was initially paper based and it can remain paper based for those who prefer that where you basically map out um, the key priorities for the day and you track uh, it in 15 minute increments or you can change the increment um, actually. Um, he, the research he's done just found that 15 minutes is a good way to focus and having um, and actually setting a timer, believe it or not. So that you, it, because what that does is it forces you to stay, to have a sense of time passing and not get distracted. Um, and then re kind of recording when, when you move off of something, bringing it back. Um, so you kind of force yourself to just keep track of what you're doing, even if it isn't what you're supposed to be doing. And I, I haven't followed it to the letter, but what really worked well for me is he came out with an app and, and a website where I can list these things electronically and effectively manage my to-do list and put the top priorities on, on any given day and move other things down to other lists that I can then move, I can drag and drop them around um, as, as time, as, as I make progress and as things get done. Um, or I can move them off the list if, if they get backgrounded. And that became really effective for me because doing it on paper was, felt like it was too much overhead, but having, having it right in my browser, um, I, have to look up, uh, I have to look up the name of it. I'll put it in the chat. Um, I just found that it, it helped me focus and I, it took me a couple of weeks to kind of find my way with it. And, and I like the fact that you can find your way. It's flexible enough to kind of pick and choose what works for you. But it, it did help me to stop moving off of things and um, flipping to a, an email and reading that and dropping what I was doing and spring the what and writing things that I needed to get done. And also breaking, uh, breaking out from planning in my own head um, the, the things that are going to take a while and mapping that to my calendar a little bit so I can set aside time for that and, not, and try not to get interrupted. Now, I haven't been doing this as much during remote because my job has kind of been blown up a bit uh, in this scenario and I haven't, it really hasn't made a lot of sense, but I'm going to come back to it. And, and um, I just felt like it was extremely helpful for me to have to merge a to-do list kind of thing with things that come up that you can throw. Yes, it was really about Well, is that on a lead? Bring a statue. <laughs> oh, All right. Um, let's go ahead and, and move on then. Uh, Martin? Uh, yes. Uh, so let's see. We've got a few other people that are talking about things here. Uh, so we got, uh, let's see, it's, uh, Sid has this Pomodoro technique. What is that? Uh, the, the Pomodoro technique is, is very similar to the um, Pierre Quand that um, Annalie just talked about. Um, you set a timer and it's, you can choose the length of increments you work, 15 minutes on a specific task and then a five minute break and you do that for several sequences and then take a longer break. Um, it's really good to, for me to keep me focused on a project that I need to get through in larger chunks. Um, I need to like not look at my email during that time or not look at other things during that time and I can really just dive into something and then when I get to the next chunk of time, the next 15 minute chunk of time, I can revise the pieces of that project that I need to complete during that time and you start to see your progress in a really tangible way and I, I really enjoy that. Okay, I haven't even thought about these kind of things. I mean to my kind of, oh, in my mind, what I was kind of more thinking of uh, is uh, how you kind of schedule things around and how you keep uh, this somewhat written down so you can then generate metrics out of it. But uh, yeah, so I mean, definitely te techniques are useful, right? So that, that, is, that is good to know about. Uh, and I probably should look into this myself. Uh, let's see who else do we have here. Uh, 
focused Fridays. Uh, we've been kind of talking about these in our group too, actually, to kind of have a day off uh, for to focus on things. I have to admit, in my case, it's pretty much impossible because uh, half of the day I'm spending watching the kids anyway. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's just additional complication that uh, most of you guys probably luckily don't have. Um, I would like to hear from somebody that are using tools that are they can generate met metrics from. Is anybody uh, out there? I uh, I see we have uh, in our work cloud we have a few people that put in. Uh, but we only have nine responders, so that's probably like one person per. So we, our biggest use, use is calendars and none, <laughs> which, is, which is more or less what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, so I don't think I'm gonna get too much help from that. Uh, Trello, so we have people, a bunch of people that are talking about Trello or Noco. Uh, what do you uh, like about that? Is anybody, uh, can anybody say something about that? I can speak to Noco. Uh, Noco is a time tracking, a uh, web-based uh, tool that lets a team put in the amount of time they spend working on particular projects or focused on particular areas of support they're providing. Uh, it allows you to aggregate up data up from the team so you can see kind of what the team's doing and then even what the group's doing all together. You have to stay on top of it or it gets difficult. Like if you have to say, oh, what was I doing two weeks ago? You're in trouble. Um, but it, it just kind of helps to get big picture ideas out of it, uh, out of the effort of a group all together. Yes, uh, but that's kind of something I have to admit I'm missing in our group is I don't really know what everybody else is doing. And we kind of knew that a little bit more when we were working together because you know you met the people in the hallway and you had a chat and stuff like that. And so uh, kind of the, the disconnect is definitely here. Uh, we do have our weekly meetings you know, and we discuss what we're doing, but, uh, but uh, you, you don't cover everything uh, uh, during that, right? So. So anyway, so this is all good. Uh, and it kind of leads us to the next topic, which is project uh, management. Yeah, so uh, we have a next call on the, how you manage your projects. And again, kind of, uh, and, and this is more or less what I, uh, what's kind of story of my life too, uh, which is that we do have a project management tool through ServiceNow that uh, uh, my supervisor, Julia, is, is using and she uses it a lot and I'm sure it works well for her. The trouble with me is that it service now is very complex software, which is kind of hard to get a hold of. You know, we are using service now for ticketing as well. And, and we all hated it first and we all got used to it. I actually quite like it now, but it took me a while to kind of go and use it. Yeah, and and I, I was forced to use service now for tickets because I handle tickets. So I'm, I'm one of the people that handles the tickets. And so uh, kind of by doing, I, le I learned it, which I am not forced to do. Uh, on the project management part. Yeah? And so what I would like to see from everybody is uh, how do they manage their projects? And so we have another poll on that. And I apologize for all these polls, but Mentimeter gives you only two slides uh, per poll for free. <laughs> so I kind of opted to do, this, to, to, to do it this way. Uh, and then I'll post the link for the results. And let's see what everybody is doing. Oops, I didn't copy that. Um, and I have to remind myself what I actually did in that poll. So, um, yeah, so how do you, again, kind of, you know, so how I, how I manage my projects now, uh, mostly in, uh, on, uh, in the documents, uh, kind of a little bit through a project, project management platform, the service now, but I go there maybe, well, in the worst case, once in three months, when we have a one-on-one -on -one with, with Julia. And uh, sometimes sooner, uh, so sometimes more often, but not very often, right? So it really the documents are my, my main sort of uh, project management strategy. So I would love to hear what everybody else to say, has to say on that. Um, let's, see. let's see what results we have. Uh, looks like I'm not really that different from everybody else either. <laughs> but you do have, uh, uh, kind of my focus again is to improve uh, on, on this, right? And so what I would like to hear from people is, is mostly from people that are using the developer platforms and project management platforms. And I do have to admit, I'm a little bit surprised that uh, uh, the GitHub and uh, uh, GitHub-like stuff and the project man management platforms are about one-to-one. -one. I was expecting that we're gonna see more of the project management. Maybe we have more uh, software developers around here that are actually sort of GitHub savvy 
and use that for, for, uh, for their uh, projects. So anyway, let's take a look over our chat here and let's see if we have somebody that, uh, that can say something about uh, sort of their more advanced approach to project management. And, and just as a heads up, we have about two more minutes before we need to move on to our next topic. All right, so maybe what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly advance. Uh, the project management is gonna tie a little bit with the time management too, right? So you kind of have to figure out somehow how you manage your time to get your project done. Um, too many windows open here. Um, I wanna to get to the next question, but if we don't get, the next question was what, what project management tools you use. Um, yeah, so, and I was kind of curious to see that too. Yeah, if people could put in the notes, some of the tools that they're mentioning in the chats, the chat and sort of things that have worked for you about it and things that haven't. And again, we're thinking here about how can we improve <laughs> our processes? Um, and meet our goals. And so with, with that kind of in mind, how has this helped you achieve what you want um, All right, so, or yeah, not, I think would be really helpful. And we could get more detail because we won't have time to talk about each of these individually. Yes, uh, you should be able to see now the next slide, Nepal, uh, what tools you use. So now I'm looking really just at the tools, including GitHub, you know, or you know, any other any other uh, uh, project manager or, or software management tool. And note, you can notice I put in service now. <laughs> and we see SharePoint, interesting. So you guys probably have a, and there are, must be more people using service now, it looks like, than just me. Tickets, that's an option. We've done, we've gone through that before. Uh, the trouble with tickets that I see is that it's kind of uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one kind of issue too, so you don't really have kind of an overall picture. Um, big bucket, okay, so that's that's like GitHub, Google Docs. I guess we do use the Google Docs too. I should say, but again, I, it's not as nice as looking at say your right or something like that. I've used right before too, but I haven't really gone in the depth of that. Some people are using Jira. Uh, we did use Jira before ServiceNow, uh, but we moved on to ServiceNow. So Martin, do you think it'd be possible when we get to the end of the topics to just do a review of the poll results? Yeah, maybe let's do that. Uh, let, let's, All uh, right, let's that sounds more. awesome. Uh, so I think what we're gonna do now then is move on to topic three. Um, topic three, is what information do you gather around internal or researcher facing activities? Um, this is a discussion we're gonna start with uh, Christina and Bob uh, to get us oriented on this conversation. Bob, you put in most of the notes here. Do you want to lead off? <laughs> sure, yeah. So um, I think this sort of ties into um, a little bit around uh, um, the first question is, um, you know, I think some of, some of the things that we do uh, naturally, like, uh, and I heard um, uh, a number of discussions around, uh, you know, looking at metrics around what the cluster usage, but also tracking office hours and tickets. And so um, it, it was, a, was a question of, um, you know, are there specific things that you do in terms of um, activities uh, and metrics that, not metrics, uh, information that you like to, to uh, gather um, so that you can uh, go on at some point later on to really understand, you know, where you're spending your time or your focus or, or maybe the, where, where you're not. Um, and so I think that's one of the questions that, uh, that we'd like to ask uh, everybody. Um, and Gladys, do you want to restate your question, if you remember from earlier? Because um, I want to make, I think it's adjacent and I want to make sure we're... Yes, I think that, um, I mean, the, the, the main question was, we all know that we have to be finding ways how to measure what we do, but um, I guess it will, de will depend on the role um, that we, you know, depending on the role that we had on the team, it's, what I'm trying to find is the practical ways that you measure, that you can quantify 
mm. at your impact. How, how do we do that? Because, I mean, oh, I met with three people this week, right? But uh, how you really measure, yeah, that was a number, but how effective right. and how, how um, quantifiable that is, you know, in terms of, right. because a project takes some time, right, to develop. And so how do you really go about measuring? That, that's my goal today to find out, okay, how is people doing this? Yeah. So I have I have a response to that if you, I, I do if as you don't well. mind. Yeah, I <laughs> <laughs> so I would I would first ask why it needs to be quantified. Um, qu numbers are important, but I think this is where I really liked um, kind of Jeff's introduction about what they did at Merced is, you know, what does the number get you, and what do you want it to mean, and then you can work backwards. Um, because in thinking about sort of in answering Bob's original question about what we measure, um, for us at UW-Madison, we track who comes to office hours. Um, we're, um, we track who, who applies for accounts because it's not an automatic thing. And at the moment, the only quantitative metric we pull is just totals, like how many people came to office hours, which I don't think is actually that meaningful. Um, I feel like we are starting to turn that data into more like how long did it take for someone from someone when someone got an account to when they ran something, which I think is really, that's a very meaningful metric, like um, mean time to log in, first job, and maybe hours above like 10, <laughs> you know, or whatever is meaningful. Um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, number of users of a new system. So we are moving in that direction. And those I think are quantitative metrics that will be helpful. But another thing, it's funny, I don't think of this as a measurement, but I think it is really important. We invite researchers to give talks at certain events we host. And those talks are actually a really great example of what we do. Um, so I'm thinking about how to turn that into something that we could like put on a report, <laughs> like see these things, because I think it shows the depth of our relationship with our, the researchers we work with. And they're really good descriptions of how they've benefited from CHCC. So, okay, I'll turn over to Bob oh, no, <laughs> and then other I'll, people in the chat. I'll just add, I think this is, these are great, great points. Um, I wanna tie back to a couple things that people had said and I'll, I'll say, you know, metrics and, and data for th their own sake is just useless. I, we pushed the reset button when our new senior director came in and just said, you know, we'd really like to look at, you know, how are we measuring our success? And so we picked three key areas. Um, and I think this goes back to Tim uh, Middlecoop's presentation on impact hours that, you know, if we're training three people and I'm spending six hours, you know, that's, you know, 18 hours of, of impact. Um, and so I think for us, it was a real, real um, uh, uh, opportunity for us to, to reassess, you know, what is important for us. Um, yeah, and you know, justification. I, I I did see that quite a bit on the earlier one, and unfortunately, I think you know, if if one gets into a justification scheme, it's that never-ending uh, gerbil wheel. Um, instead, I think what 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 is important is actually show, um, showing impact. Um, that you know, we've felt you know these. And I'm not I'm not dissing that. I take that back. But it is is showing we've helped this many people in this many departments and. In, in these areas where that hadn't been using these resources before. So I know justification is a part of that, but I think that the showing the success, I think is also a really important uh, thing to do as well. Um, and let's go to, um, let's see, uh, I, there is a poll. So um, uh, make sure if you haven't already, um, on that and um, we'll also then bring up uh, the results. Yeah, and Bob and I kind of dived in, but it would be great to hear from other folks about what, what you are yes. tracking qualitatively or quantitatively and why. Again, with this focus on, as I think was introduced at the beginning of achieving goals or improving performance um, in that in that context, um, kind of evaluating your own success, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, uh, on, uh, Christina, we're trying to focus more on your personal uh, stuff, right? Not on your organizational stuff, at least in my mind. 
I well, oh, this this we're year expanding Carol, the discussion a bit. <laughs> yeah, because this is really here about you know what you you know uh, internal researcher facing activities. It's like what are you doing and, and or what are what are you tracking for other people? But you know, I I also just I do track my time on this, but that's not as meaningful as possibly what other other things that we're handling. Um, interesting number of tickets, publications coming up. Um, I did see Drucker time analysis, which I think is rather interesting. It, someone uh, put that in. Is, does anybody want to speak up about that? Yeah, that was, that was me. So darker time analysis is basically what are your responsibilities? Uh, and you make a guess at what time you're spending against each one of those things. So it might be uh, reporting on CI up to the CIO or the VPR and then tasks within that. And then what you're doing is measuring your, what you're spending every 15 minutes on and then seeing how that correlates against what you said you were going to spend that time on. So was it, you know, three equal buckets or is it 50%, 25, 25, and then you can compare the time spent. Um, it's a little more challenging to figure out, you know, against that 50, 25, 25, were you effective in those ratios, but at least time spent, if your time is effective, then that's a rough approximation. And so I have that in a Google spreadsheet and it actually populates a visualization, a bar chart basically. Uh, and it's not just against the work elements. I have that across, you know, how many hours I sleep too uh, in a 24 hour period. So and I can look at that and compare it to, you know, what I'm doing. And then once a week I tune and I have the luxury of, a, of an executive assistant. So she helps play me, cal uh, me to play calendar defense uh, so that I have time to work on things in the appropriate ratios. That's great. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Uh, just in the interest of time then, uh, so we can get to the last question as part of a wrap up. I do want to ask, um, you know, since we are uh, working with, uh, you know, uh, cyber infrastructure advanced CI um, and a lot of, um, we have people here, both researcher and data facing, curious if people are, anybody's using any uh, natural language processing, machine language, or sorry, machine learning, deep learning tools um, to help with their analysis on, um, on, uh, on the data that you have or um, in, in, you know, getting, information about guidance for for strategies and you know if there are data visualizations that that you particularly use I and mean, scott mentioned bar charts and we've kept it simple you know in our group right now to start as, as well using very simple charts to really give us a, a better understanding so um, there is a poll there um, so if you would go and uh, take that poll as well thank you martin for setting those up um, and so do oh, you, you what's that may i Yes. So here's a really simple and kind of dumb one. I have a spreadsheet that keeps track of all of my staff and my uh, contacts out to uh, researchers, whether they're PIs or grad students or whatever. And we have drop down field of what faculty and then what department they're in. That goes back to a map on another tab that simply shows all of the faculties, all 18 faculties that we have, and then the departments within which is 66 departments within the 18 faculties. And that will show that I can pull that up for the CIO or the VPR, uh, basically a heat map of how many departments and, and the like we touch. It's really simple, it's really mm -hmm. stupid, but it really rolls up well to the interest level of a CIO or the VPR. Right, that's fantastic. Does anybody have any other, uh, any other um, ideas or suggestions that have really been successful for them? Uh, using sentiment analysis. Um, it's still not 100% perfect, but um, if you are doing surveys of responses and do sentiment analysis on, on ticket postings, mm -hmm. uh, that will give you a little bit of a flavor. Um, also just topic modeling um, what are the hot topics that uh, any conversations or emails or things like that, uh, that will be like for us right now, the hot topic is access to GPUs and 
why don't we have more V100s? It's like, well, there's no money. Uh, so, um, but that gives us a little bit of um, texture to add to the narrative when we're going after budget um, of is, are the communications positive or negative and things like that. Yeah. That's great. I, I would wonder if the tickets would skew more towards the negative. <laughs> Um, great. Oh, so, and then, uh, the poll results, we actually have, um, let's see, an average of 1.2, I guess one is no and two is yes. So 1.2 on advanced tools and data visualizations of 1.7. So, um, so it seems like there is some interest in, in the, um, NLP, ML, and DL tools. So that'd be possibly a good thing for, for future uh, future calls as well. So and with that, I'll pass it along to um, back to Jana for number four. All right, thank you, Bob. So our last question that we're interested in digging into today is with all this work, are there specific goals you are striving towards? Um, one of the, I really like this question because it's so easy to get caught up into the project of the hour or uh, solving, you know, being reactive to whatever seems to be just landing in front of you. Uh, but having, having a clear vision of specific goals, uh, when I started at Northwestern, uh, the goal was stated at the get-go was to, the, the goal understanding it was, it was a big reach was research from day one, you know, that people would be able to start on our on our high performance compute cluster and get going immediately. Um, so that's, I'm just offering that up because I've found that goal kind of continually in aspirational and inspiring. Uh, and it helps me to remember because things that I do to forward individual projects or solve individual problems aren't necessarily gonna really move the needle on research from day one. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing about some of the other goals that people um, have found to help guide their efforts, I'd like the star for the navigating in the ocean. So uh, um, let's see, actually, let's, Jeffrey, if you don't mind contributing again, um, the goal at US, sorry, UCSC of birthright research IT. I'm curious what that means. So when we walk onto a campus or into a restaurant or, you know, even into a, someone's home, we're always, we expect there to be electricity and a Wi-Fi password. And, you know, um, we expect sort of this baseline of services. And on a campus that includes, you know, heat in the classroom and electricity and, and Wi-Fi and a library and, and all of these services that we've come to expect on a campus. Um, but we don't have the expectation of being able to, as you say, um, HPC from day one. Um, and Birthright IT is a similar idea where new researchers or under-resourced researchers um, or uh, graduate students or whoever can step onto a campus and have similar expectations for support of their research through research IT as they do for every other aspect of their campus life. Yeah, that's that's very good. And and I liked that you threw in Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have put that in that category. Um, but today it definitely is. So it's it's one of those things that the culture needs to pay attention to the expectations and the needs and as, as it changes. Um, I'm it also interested. Be, it used yeah. to be that, um, you know, network was a sort of a bespoke exotic thing, uh, just in general. Um, and now it's just part of what we do. So that's what I'm always arguing for. Let's just make research IT part of what we do. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Deborah, can you speak? Uh, this is for Deborah McCaffrey. Could you speak for a moment about uh, researchers contacting us about projects before or at the grant preparation stage? Yeah, we're just trying to improve relations with researchers. So they include us in the planning and we can tell them, hey, we're not gonna let that on the network. Don't put it in your budget, <laughs> stuff like that. So, and we can also help them out of uh, fully cost, things like doing their project in the cloud, um, 
just things like that because we run into a lot of stuff where the grant is already uh, awarded and they put something in the budget that we can't allow on our network and they're just out of luck. Yeah, that's that's a really good goal to, to have those relationships and to have those conversations because as you said, the the nightmare scenario is the project drops, the grant arrives, and they never wrote in any consideration of the resources on the ground, and and now you need to make it work. So, yeah, building out those relationships. Absolutely. Um, yeah, go I on. I was just going to add, that's how I would, uh, this is a great question, because I, you know, I think a lot of these goals are implicit in some of what we do, but I would characterize one of our goals at CHDC is building trust relationships like that and that drives some of the actions we take like how quick our ticket response time is and our personalized consultation for accounts and that kind of thing because those are actions we can take to support that goal. Yeah. Bob you also included research anywhere anytime. That's pretty succinct, but is there anything more you want to say on that? Yeah, no, it was a, it was kind of an interesting thing because um, you know uh, we're one of, we're we're actually like uh, uh, Christina and Lauren's group um, where we we as the the RC group are not in charge of our infrastructure. We actually work with IT on that, and it's taken some um, some significant. You know, I've been there now four years, and we're still working with them to to make sure that you know it's not a 8 a.m. to 7 7 p.m. But you know, we as we as um, as as uh, RC staff are kind of you know I wouldn't say officially on the hook all the time, but we like to keep to keep the uh, the lights on and, and the research going. And you know, having been you know done my own research for a number of years, I know how important it is. You know, at 10 at night, you you're stuck and you don't want to be stuck because you're now focused on that. So really trying to 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 help. Um, uh, uh, work with our IT group to, to make sure that we can do that for the researchers, whether they're on campus. We have a lot of people doing field research around the, around the world. So we make, want to make sure that they have those, these capabilities, you know, no matter what they are, where they are, and also what device they're using, their iPhones, iPads, tablets, you know, if they're doing interviews or whatever. And so for us, that, that mantra, anywhere, anytime, really is kind of embodied how we want to make sure that the researchers are empowered to be able to do the work that they need to do. All right, that really underscores too that in today's climate, we're supporting people across multiple time zones, multiple hemispheres. There, there is a new dimension to that that maybe wasn't there before. Um, we have time for, I think, one more um, Clark. I was hoping we could hear from Clark uh, Gaylord. Uh, about the message. So you had a, a chat comment about the message that researchers hear. Right. Okay. So, I mean, I, I was just riffing on the, um, we want researchers to contact us. And I think that's absolutely true. And I've often found that needing to get in front of researchers, but if, if the message that we're delivering to them is, well, the reason you have to contact me is because we're not going to let you connect to the network, then they're just going to take their chances and never contact us. Uh, you know, if, if the issue is that our, our uh, IT security people are so hostile to network, then it seems to me our job in research computing is to bludgeon the IT security people, not the researcher. Yeah, and that, that illustrates that that special relationship we have, that advocating for researchers and, and making things possible that otherwise wouldn't happen. Yeah, and that takes a lot of developing that credibility with the security folks, too. You know, they can't see... The research computing people as not knowing anything about research, you have to develop that credibility with them on the one hand, but at the same time, you're going to say, look, researchers have to get the job done. I'll work with them to get it secured, but no is not an option. Yeah, exactly. That was something else they told me on the first day that, that we are not the department of no, we are the department of yes. Yeah, which requires creativity. So one of the, the themes that keeps popping up is these relationships, relationships with researchers, relationships with um, other parts of IT that we need to work with closely to make sure that research can be prioritized and happen in a reasonable way. Um, so that's, that's very interesting, the relationship builders. That, that sounds like it fits, to be honest. All right, so we are winding down here. 
Uh, thank you everyone for participating today. If you haven't signed in, please do so now. We especially like um, meeting new people who join us for the first time and then um, getting to know the, the breadth of our community. Uh, just a reminder, this call was recorded and the recording will be up soon. We'll send that out in a post-call email. Thanks to our topical speakers today, we had Christina Koch, Martin Kuma, and Bob Freeman. And I followed up too, I'm Jana Nugent. Today's topic was, how are you doing? And I certainly hope that the, the larger answer is we're all doing okay. So uh, let's keep this conversation going. Our next um, call will be on July 9th. I can't believe that, that's gonna be after the 4th of July, wow. Uh, we do not have a fixed topic yet. If you have suggestions, we have a um, call, we have a document for our um, proposing topics and we'd love to hear from you. Um, and I just want to thank everybody who worked on the call. So that's uh, Claire, Christina, Wirwan, Martin, Anneli, Amy, Katya, Bob, and I'm Jana Nugent. So thanks again for coming, everybody. We'll see you next month. Stay safe. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.